Well, we, ha we have a, uh, a wonderful thing here. In addition to what we just saw and, and the inspiration of all of it, we're, we're actually on time. Um, you know, those, those of us who've been involved with events like this always wonder how you stay on time, and we are on time. And I'd like to say a little bit about our first panel. Um, a number of comments were made in the introductory remarks this morning about um, uh, this 21st century environmentalism and some of the problems that we uh, currently face. This first panel we're hoping will, uh, and we expect, will, um, more than hope, uh, <laughs> will, will really uh, help us delve into some of, the, uh, some of these emerging issues and also some of the ways we see um, environmental education uh, being responsive to those changes in the, in the future. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, the first panel to, to come on up here. I think there's a, yeah, there's a way up over on the other side. So I'm going to turn this over to um, Dr. McNutt, who's, uh, the, as we heard already from David, the, the head of the U.S. Geologic Survey. And um, Marcia, I want to say one thing very quickly. Uh, we're expecting Nancy Sutley to perhaps stop by. Uh, uh, so when she does uh, stop by, we would like to give her the opportunity to make a couple of comments about this panel as well. Okay. But otherwise, we're going to turn it over to you. And uh, thank you, panelists, all for being here. Okay, great. Um, well, good morning. Uh, as Bob said, I'm Marsha McNutt. I'm director of the USGS. And before I introduce the panel, um, I'm going to take uh, John Carson up on his uh, suggestion that we each take a moment to say something about our inspiration for becoming involved in environmental education. And um, Mine comes from the fact that um, as a, a geoscientist, I remember back to a day when I was at a high school, having been asked to come and speak to some classes there as a uh, lecturer when I was on the faculty at MIT. And I remember speaking to one of the, um, one of the teachers at the high school saying, now, these um, students that I'm speaking to, these um, students in uh, earth science classes, can you give me a little bit of background? How many of them, for example, will be going on to college? And the teacher said, oh, you don't understand. These are our earth science students. They won't be going to college. Now, I don't often lose my cool. <laughs> But the thought that in this high school, they were tracking all of the students that were not intending to go to college into the earth sciences. And the college-bound students were going into physics and chemistry and biology immediately made me upset because I thought we were well beyond the days of rocks for jocks. And now leading the largest agency in the federal government that does science for the natural sciences, uh, for um, geology, for um, uh, hydrology, for geospatial work, and for uh, ecology. And knowing how important it is for every citizen to basically have an owner's manual for planet Earth. It is, we can't leave this to chance. It is very important that we have not only professionals that will staff agencies like mine, 
but that we have every citizen understand how to be a, um, a, a useful user of this planet that is basically our only home and the only planet that we know of that can be a suitable habitat for us. So that is why I am here today. Now, let me introduce our distinguished panel that we have today to discuss um, our first topic. And our uh, first topic is uh, entitled 21st Century Environmentalism, Shaping the Emerging Vision for Environmental Education. And I am very pleased to introduce Pat Pineda, who's the group vice president for National Philanthropy and the Toyota USA Foundation of Toyota Motor North America. So welcome, Pat. Thank and we also have Judy Bross, who's the executive director for North America Association for Environmental Education. Welcome, Judy. And we have Andrew Rotherham, who's co-founder and partner of Bellwether Education. And he's also an educational uh, columnist for time. Andrew, <laughs> welcome. And Dr. Daniel Bloomstein, who's a professor for ecology and uh, evolutionary biology at UCLA. And we have uh, Charles Salen, and um, Charles is uh, a um, uh, is is best known for having uh, co-founded the Ocean uh, Conservation Society, and uh, he has uh, also um, written um, some well-known books, I believe. Right, Charles? <laughs> One well-known. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so welcome, Charles. And uh, Bridget Howe, who's manager um, of program services for the Girl Scout Council here in the nation's capital. So welcome, Bridget. So I'm wondering, before we launch into the questions, uh, whether you'd each like to take a minute to talk about your journey here into uh, environmental education. So. Uh, would you each like to, to take a minute for that, starting with Pat? Sure. Well, you know, I joined Toyota in 1984, and we work under a global Earth Charter, which really guides our, our business um, and, and our practices as they relate to the environment. And we have been committed from the outset to being uh, socially responsible around our, our environment and to do all we can to shrink our environmental footprint. And when I joined the company in 1984, I always tell folks that it was a time when it was not cool to, to recycle, it wasn't cool to be an environmentalist. And I remember being so impressed by the fact that we were already eliminating waste. Uh, uh, making sure that we minimize whatever it was that we used of our natural resources, you know, be it water or otherwise. And I was very struck by that. And, and it, was, it was so wonderful because I always considered myself an environmentalist. And now I was working with a company where I felt very proud and I felt that my interests could be aligned with the work that I was doing with the company. Fast forward, I, I served in, in um, two general counsel positions uh, with Toyota. And um, seven years ago, I moved to New York uh, to eventually take on the Toyota USA Foundation and National Philanthropy. And we, we had a conversation about what should we be focused on. And you know, Toyota has contributed over um, half a billion dollars since 1991 in the US. And as we were looking at where should those dollars go, one of the areas that um, I felt very inspired about and so advocated for was the environment should be one of our primary focus areas because it's been about, it's been a lot of what we've been about. So 
as we looked at environment, we looked at environmental education. And I just want to say that over the last few years, and, and Judy has been a very close partner mm -hmm. of mine during her time at, at Audubon and Bob for CSB as well. And I just have to tell you that when I go out into the field and talk to people involved in our programs, I have seen the life transforming nature of environmental education. You know, everything from at risk uh, urban youth to mid-career environmental leaders. And I can't tell you how many events I have been to where people are crying. And so <laughs> that is so inspiring to me, and, and I, I, that's my story. Great, thanks. thanks so much, Pat. Okay, Judy. Thanks, Pat. I, I think I'm in events where people are crying, but probably for different reasons. Um, <laughs> no. Um, I got my start, actually, in pretty rural Ohio. Um, I worked in a park near Knock'em Stiff, Ohio, and Possum Trot. I talk about that as my um, Peace Corps experience in the U.S. Um, and since then, I have been so lucky, using the time I spent outside and with mentors, to be able to work at places like the National Wildlife Federation. I see my colleagues here. I worked at Peace Corps and was able to see environmental issues from a global perspective. I worked at World Wildlife Fund. It was amazing and was able to do so many incredible things with partners there. And then I was at Audubon. I see my Audubon uh, friends here and uh, so many wonderful things. And I learned from each position. And now I'm um, heading up an association that's really looking at what this summit is all about. How can we strengthen the field of environmental ed? So I'm really thrilled to be here with partners like Pat Pineda and everyone else on this wonderful panel. Okay, great. Andrew? So I guess I'll give the personal answer, which I usually don't <laughs> give. So I, when I was in first grade, uh, I had a teacher who was convinced that I should be put on medication or something because I couldn't pay attention and so forth. And yet every afternoon, I'd be outside. I spent a lot, of, a lot of my time fishing. I grew up on a lake. I'd be outside learning about the natural world and was really engaged in that and so forth. And my mom, who was a teacher, uh, sat down with this first grade teacher and said, you know, the problem just may well be that you're just not a very good teacher. Um, uh, uh, and because he'll sit still, even when the fish aren't biting, he'll sit still on the dock for six hours and we have to drag him out of there to get him home for dinner in bed. Um, uh, and so flash forward from that, I sort of just developed a, an, an interest of sort of my various stints in school and graduate school. The degree I'm probably most excited about is I'm a graduate of the Outward Bound School. I led wilderness programs myself, and I see it with my kids. I have two young girls. Um, this is the part I don't usually talk about. I have, I have two young girls, and uh, I see it with them, sort of the understanding that they're able at a pretty young age uh, to operate in, in the outside world. They're more handy with a fly rod than a lot of people four or five yeah. times their age. Um, and I see what it does for them in terms of those skills, how that transfers to an understanding of the need to be a good steward, what it means. Uh, they, they understand in a, in a sort of the way you understand when you're pretty young that we're all downstream, but they, they sort of intuitively get that. Um, and, and so those skills, so it's something that I see is, is just is hugely important both in terms of people's development, their self-confidence and so forth, actually again, particularly uh, for girls but also uh, just as a way to sort of introduce people to the importance of these issues in some sort of subtle and early ways. Okay, Dan. I was at the first Earth Day with my mom. Grew up in yeah. Philadelphia, um, and Schuylkill River, you know, was really polluted, and we got some water, and it was clear, and we had a stand, and we talked about water pollution. It was a, it was a teach-in, and we were learning, and I learned that clean water doesn't, isn't necessarily clean. And I was pretty fortunate. We moved to the suburbs. Um, and I had a wooded lot behind our, our house, and I got into outdoor things early, and I spent a lot of my youth and, and certainly college um, years climbing and hiking and, and sailing and being and skiing and, and being outside. Um, I studied biology. I'm a biologist. Um, I've been really fortunate to, to work all over the world, and I've been learning from the people around the world working in national parks in Pakistan, um, working in Australia, working in Europe, um, that we all sort of have uh, you know, the, the, the same common problems. And when I met Charlie, um, we wrote a book called The Failure of Environmental Education and How We Can Fix It. So maybe we're a bit of a buzzkill here. But, um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, we, we, we sort of, from very different perspectives, came to uh, a very similar realization, which I think I'll share with you as well, that we got to do a better job, that um, we're, we're living um, right now, um, the world is living at about, you know, 1.4 Earths in terms of our ecological footprint. That ain't sustainable. And while we all you know, have been very successful at raising awareness, 
we think that we're, we're struggling to, to sort of get to action. We've been talking and thinking quite a bit about this, and we need help, and we all need to work together. And we'll have more comments, I'm sure. Okay. But that's my journey. All right. Charlie? Well, I, it's similar to Dan's. I, I, I grew up, I was fortunate uh, to spend most of my childhood in the mountains as a climber and later on as a sailor on, on the ocean. Um, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness, and my particular uh, bent on that was to go as far away from humanity as I could get. And uh, I think what brought me to this and to write the book with Dan was that uh, in my lifetime, which is relatively short in uh, Earth, Earth timelines, uh, I've seen all of those things impacted. I've seen all of those things shrinking. I've seen where, where I, I never saw evidence of humanity, now it's, it's pretty common. So these things that we take for granted, these, this, this incredible vastness of, of Earth, really isn't vast. I mean, populations doubled twice in my lifetime, darn near. So you know, these are things that, that need addressing. And I think my uh, commitment to environmental education or to environmental research is based on that. I'd, I'd like to have some part in, in maybe reversing that process. So that's how I got here. So. Bridget? I don't think it'll surprise anybody that my first exposure to the environment and learning about it was at Girl Scouts. Um, when I was a Girl Scout, um, eight years old, I was a brownie, and we were working on our ecology badge at the time. And since then, uh, I've been lucky enough in my career in Girl Scouts to be able to continue that. And four years ago, my council was offered the opportunity to be one of the pilot councils for the Girl Scouts Forever Green program. And through that, we, through experiential education in the informal setting, we reach out to girls and get them involved. And um, that's been kind of my exposure to this field. Okay. So Bridget, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, why do you think collaboration and partnerships are so critical for the future of environmental education? And how have strategic partnerships, Girl Scouts Forever Green and STEM efforts, played a role in educating youth? That's a terrific question. Uh, we definitely rely on collaboration. I think a huge piece of it, and, I, and we heard it a lot in the opening remarks today, a huge piece of it, of course, is, in my experience, we don't necessarily have the expertise. And what we hear from our troop leaders, who are the delivery, the delivery mechanism of Girl Scout programming is through an amazing, dedicated core of volunteers, our troop leaders. And our troop leaders, one of the barriers for them in these topics is that they don't feel that they necessarily have the expertise. They might be able to take, they are able to take girls out on hikes, to take girls into the outdoors, to help them identify trees and leaves, to say, let's recycle, let's do a cleanup. But maybe they don't have the scientific and technical, technological expertise to answer the, the questions that might come up, the whys the next step, the questions that maybe you need, you, they think you might need a PhD to understand. Where we can get, where we rely on collaboration is getting our partners to help give us that expertise and help us explain that information to our members, both girls and adults, in ways that they can understand and that they can share with girls. Um, I wanna just give a couple of examples of how that's worked for us. One is a partnership that we have with Booz Allen Hamilton, who funds our Environmental Leadership Institute. And this is a program that we put on for girls in sixth through eighth grade, which for us is an age where they're starting to think about things other than Girl Scouts. Uh, and we want to keep them involved in Girl Scouting. We want to encourage them to use their Girl Scout experience to take action in their communities to be leaders. And through the Environmental Leadership Institute, we encourage them to take action through in the environment and to do earn their silver award, which is the highest award for that age level, by doing environmental projects. And Booz Allen Hamilton, which is, funds that project, but in addition to funding it, they help us, they collaborate with us. They lend the expertise of their employees who come and work side by side with girls, which is just terrific to see, and it's amazing <coughs> to have the employees engaged in that way. They also help connect us with other people that they fund, other organizations. And through that, we've been able to build, bring in partners that we would nece wouldn't necessarily have been able to access before, like the National Building Museum, which does a terrific Green Cities program. And they came and led workshops for our girls at the last Environmental Leadership Institute. That program has an amazing success rate. We have <coughs> girls who go through it. They come in and they say, I don't know anything about the environment. I don't know anything about environmental careers. And I don't really think I want to do an environmental project for my silver award. And they walk out the door at the end of the weekend. It's an overnight program at camp. They walk out of the door at the end of the weekend and say, oh my gosh, 
not only do I want to do my silver award in an environmental program, but I want to do this for a living. How can I find out more about it? And it's because of that collaboration. Uh, one more example just to build on that is, uh, again, another collaboration we have with Boeing. And this was an amazing strategic partnership that it also, the EPA was also involved in. We did a town hall meeting where we brought together five sites five Boeing locations and Girl Scouts in each of those locations across the country, Seattle, California, St. Louis, Chicago, and then here in Washington, DC, connected via satellite and had a town hall meeting about the environment to inspire girls again to take environmental action, not just to educate them about the issues, but to inspire them to make those changes. And again, with Boeing's support and the collaboration and partnership with them, we were able to bring in expertise that our leaders and our girls didn't necessarily have and give them the exposure that they needed. Okay. Well, thanks, Bridget. Um, Andrew, let's jump to you and talk about the role of the educational system next. Uh, given all the competing demands on uh, teachers' and students' time these days, and uh, particularly evolving school standards, how do you see environmental education fitting into the formal K-12 classroom? Sure. And again, thank you for having me. Um, let me... Let me pay you all the compliment of directness. Um, so when Arnie was up here, you heard him and he talked about the, the dropout rates. Let me, let me just make sure everybody kind of gets what that actually looks like. So in this country right now, 8% of low-income kids are going to get a bachelor's degree by the time they're 24. And that compares with almost 80% of affluent kids. So when you hear people talking about the achievement gap, that's what they're talking about. 8%. I mean, that should just be like a full stop. That is a staggering figure. Um, especially given what we know about economic mobility and the power of having a bachelor's degree, particularly for low-income Americans. So that's the thrust right now of what's happening in schools, is the folks who are concerned about that, they have the levers of power. They're increasingly setting the policy agenda. That's not going to get turned back. I happen to think it's a good thing that that doesn't get turned back. We're starting to have these conversations. So for you all, I really see the challenge. It's about building ties. So I mean, my, the, my core message to you is you got to integrate. Um, you got to build ties to these groups. And I can tell you, I'm in a lot of these conversations. I write this column for time, and I think that's probably mostly why I'm here, because Charles was being modest about his book. It, it, at least it warranted a review in Time Magazine. Um, uh, uh, and, but I'm also sort of, I earn my, my primary living as a day job as a consultant on education issues, work with states, school districts, and so forth. These issues are just not on the table. They're not talking about these things. They're concerned about that 8% figure. They're trying to figure out what to do. You all need to get into that conversation. You need to get into it not sort of coming at them, not attacking accountability and so forth. That, that, that's not how you start these conversations. You need to come at that, that there's a role to play here in how you solve these problems. And so you have this tremendous opportunity with these new standards. And you know, if anyone's actually looked at the standards we use in schools right now, I'm actually a former, um, uh, a former state official. I mean, a lot of states, like the only people who, who read them are the people who write them. They're unteachable. <laughs> you just cannot physically teach them in a 180, 185 day school year. The new standards, they're much more simple. There's a website called Common Core. Go look at them. And 45 states have agreed to adopt these. Um, they give an opportunity to develop new kinds of curriculum, much more text-based things and so forth. A lot of the things we're talking about, so Trout Unlimited, for instance, has a really cool initiative called Trout in the Classroom, where they come in and they teach kids about the life cycle of fish and so forth. You can also do that. Trout need cold water to survive. Above a certain degree no, uh, no temperature, no species of trout can survive. You can teach kids about math while you're teaching about these things. You can teach kids about literature, particularly those of you who perhaps are, are, are Hemingway aficionados will get this, but there's lots of literature there. So you can use these things as a way to integrate into the, the, the curriculum, and I would just urge you that that's the way into the conversation, and that's the way to actually get this into the work of schools, because if this becomes about another sort of 40-minute thing where you do everything else, and then for 40 minutes every other week you're teaching environmental education, you guys are going to be you're going to be dead in the water, and you see other movements. You know, the people want to teach more entrepreneurialism in school. They're bumping up against us. They want to teach courses on entrepreneurialism, when in fact what they should be doing is saying, how do you learn about great American entrepreneurs? What can they teach us, and how do you learn about that when you're trying to teach reading? How do you learn about those stories as you teach history and civics? And you all need to be thinking that that same way, that sort of holistic uh, that holistic approach. And I think that's the way because there's lots of people in the conversations that I'm in who are very sympathetic to this, as I am personally. And so they would, they would welcome you, but what they hear is a lot of rhetoric that sort of makes people wonder how committed, and this is the part where I said I would flatter you with directness, 
how committed this movement is to this goal of addressing this 8% problem, and I think you need to lead with, you are committed to that, and you bring something to the table about how to do that. Uh, if I could just sort of... Yeah, okay, why don't we go to, to Dan and Charlie. Uh, you've written the book on the, the failure of uh, environmental education. What, what do you say to what Andrew has I, I just want to follow up specifically suggested. with what Andrew says, because I think he's absolutely right on. Um, you know, we, we talk about, um, we were brought here to be provocative. Um, we, 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 uh, we, we, we talk about maybe we should just pull the environmental out of education. We need to create wise citizens who will take care of the future and be stewards of the earth. And that requires students to understand about the environment, essentially. It involves students who understand about politics, literature, aesthetics. It involves students that um, understand how to create change. My son's being tested to death in a California elementary school that has some of the highest marks, um, you know, marks in Los Angeles. Um, yet he is thrilled when he gets to do project-based learning and he's not doing enough of that. And we have to get people out there and uh, train them to be citizens of the earth. And we really don't have a lot of time for that. I'd, I'd like to add specifically to what Andy said as well, that, that I think also uh, when you look at dropout rates and you look and you compare that to socioeconomic divisions in our society, I think one of the things that environmental education really desperately needs to do is find ways to get into communities that previously have not been reached, poor communities, uh, communities that everybody else ignores, that their own municipality ignores. And, and maybe the way in there is through environmental justice, you know, appealing to people on environmental justice basis. But I think we have to address those communities and the communities that we we currently, uh, I don't think, put enough energy into, into uh, going after, so. So Pat, on that note, why don't we go to you next, and can you um, make the case for us about reaching the diverse population? Why is that important? How are we gonna do that? And why is communication uh, critical to our efforts? Interestingly, um, Toyota has a very strong commitment to diversity and it really permeates all that we do. And when we started down the path of the environment, and I'm going to be very honest, uh, as we started to engage with environmental organizations, the initial reaction was when we talked about diversity was we're an environmental group. We're not a diversity group. And and, I, and I'm happy to report that every organization we're working with has seen the light in a, in a very big way because the conversation really centered around, if you look at the changing demographics of this country, if diversity is not at the heart of that environmental education and messaging, you're talking to yourself and you will not achieve the goals of conservation in this country or globally. So for us, uh, for me, as, as a uh, person who oversees our grant making, diversity is, is critical. And if we're going to make a change around the environment and conservation, that has to be at the core. Another thing that we have talked with our partners about, and, and we're also sort of retooling ourselves as a company, is you, know, you look around, communication in this country, in, in the world, has just completely changed in our lifetime. And you know, the great advantage is we have now communication tools like never before. And you know, you know just at Toyota, we were always uh, wanting to be humble about our, our good works and, and we've had to sort of look at that differently and, and we've had the conversations with our partners who also had the same mentality that you know, our good works should speak for themselves. And, and we said no. We need to join together and start to work on communicating what we're doing because we have to think about what does communication do? It helps you reach communities. It gets your story out. And in fact, in our, in our various programs, one of our, our, you know, we've got a $20 million program with Audubon. And one of the key components of the training is teaching the participants to tell their, their story. And, and I always say to environmental groups, if you're looking at sustainable programs, you can't always look for us to be there to support you. 
So you need to learn to tell your story, to create sustainable programs, attract people who will support you, donors. Um, so one, I think communication is important. Uh, I think communication is key to raising awareness around the environment. And again, I think diversity is critical and we need to get the message into communities. And one thing I'd like to say on diversity, it's not about doing it for diverse communities. It's about allowing diverse communities to care and steward their own communities. And I have to tell you, we have an array of programs reaching diverse communities and I've seen incredibly passionate engagement and, and stewardship. So I'm actually very optimistic about the possibilities. Okay, okay. Judy, now I'm gonna give you the tough job here. I want you to wrap up this uh, thread we've had here because as the executive director of North American Association for Environmental Education, how do you take what we've just heard and create a vision for the 21st century for environmental education? <laughs> okay, um, I knew I should have called up sick today. Um, that, that's a tough question, but an exciting one. And I just really, before, why I have the mic, just to thank the administration and everyone here for having this summit. I think this is part of the vision forward. We're gathered together to talk about how we can strengthen the field. Everything that my colleagues have said is terrific. We need to do more. We need to address the 8%. Um, we need to really engage diversity and inclusion, as Pat said, because it's the future, and we need to work together on so many things. Let me just say a couple of things about when I think of the vision forward and I think of NAAE and I think of all our partners in the room, I think about developing a culture of hope. I think the environmental community has often focused on the doom and gloom and woe is us and it scares people, it overwhelms people. And when you think about the power of hope, we're all in this room and in this field because we have hope that we can change things. I was just at a great event and I see my colleague Jackie Ogden from Disney. It was a celebration of 100 kids who have done amazing things. And I was talking to one of the educators who was from New Jersey in a very um, urban, depressed area, and she took on a project with her students to help um, improve a reservoir in the community. And she said she saw light in their eyes, she saw a change, and she saw them build self-esteem. And she said, it gave me hope, I was depressed, I was really worried, and there were tears in her eyes. And of course then I'm like starting to cry. Um, it really can make a difference. And environmental education, I think, is the anecdote to engaging a more diverse and inclusive society and really adapting to the change that we're all experiencing. Um, Will Rogers said that even though you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. <laughs> and it's human nature to just sit there. We've done it before, we can do it. We need to adapt to the change, as Lisa Jackson said. And when I see the faces in this room, but also having worked on Together Green, which was an amazing partnership between Toyota and Audubon, I did see people's lives change and diversity and inclusion was a critical part. And it wasn't us engaging, it was together we were sharing and trying to figure out the solutions to the problems that we had. Um, I also never thought, you know, if you know me, you know I like quotes, Cindy Lauper. I never thought that I'd quote her at the White House, but she said, <laughs> if you want a stronger society, it has to be inclusive. If you have to push a boulder up a hill, do you want 10 people or do you want 100? If you weed out color and gender, you get 10. We are starting to embrace, finally, the diversity of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, culture, and more. It will make this movement so much stronger. We need to have more innovative partnerships, and I do think that's a vision. How many of you would say you're working on innovative partnerships? Raise your hand. Okay, we've got a lot of amazing partners, and I know I'm partnering with a lot of you. We need to do more and better and different partners, and we've got, we're gonna hear from more people about that. All audiences are relevant for environmental education, and if we do our jobs right, there won't be environmental education. It'll just be how we do our work. It will just be how we do good education, both in the formal system and in the non-formal system. And the non-formal system is really important. We spend actually only about 5% of our lives in school, really, really important. 
But think of all the other ways we learn in society, as Lisa was saying, lifelong learning is critical and there is so much that we can do when we're thinking about all the avenues, the new technology of how we can make a difference. Somebody mentioned STEM and STEM is really important. If we wanna be competitive, thinking about science, technology, engineering, and math, I'd like to add two other letters to that. I'd like to add E, another E for environment, and A for arts, because I think it's the interdisciplinary. So it's esteem. See, E dash S-T-E-A-M. Because the <laughs> interdisciplinary piece, so I was just talking with the head of engineering at the National Academy of Sciences. And if you haven't ever looked at the grand challenges for engineering, they're amazing. And a lot of them are about environment. These are challenges of how do we solve the problems of today? Let me just see if I can uh, read a couple of them. Actually, I can't find them. But, um, oh, here we go. Making solar energy economical. So there are classes that are trying to look at that. Provide energy from fusion. Develop carbon sequest sequestration methods. Provide access to clean water. So there are classes tackling this from an engineering point of view. And he said, we need environmental education because a lot of our engineers and I hate to stereotype, he said, but they're not people people. And we need to talk about the people. We need to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion. We need to work together on these issues. Just a couple more points. Research and evaluation, really, really important in the future. We're doing some really amazing things. There's NAA's research symposium that many of you are a part of. There's a lot of research that's going on so many places, Cornell, National Wildlife Federation, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. It's just so many great things, National Geographic Society, Fish and Wildlife Service, but we need so much more. We need longitudinal studies. For people who say environmental ed doesn't work, there's a lot of research that says, yes, it does work, but that doesn't mean we don't need more research and actually more support to evaluate what we're actually doing. Um, I had a colleague at, at Audubon who used to say, you gotta use your gut but your gut isn't always right, and you can make a giant mistake if you're just trusting your gut. So you gotta have measures along the way and a theory of change to say, if we do this, then this will happen, and this will happen, and measuring it along the way. And we are starting to embrace that culture of evaluation and research, but we need to do a lot more. And finally, I just wanna say one thing in terms of the vision for the future, and that's we, we do need more support for environmental education. We need to put our collective heads together. The field as a field has been woefully underfunded for so many years, since I've been in the field. And I think we can do so many creative things. It was so helpful to hear Lisa and Bob talking about EPA's commitment, Secretary of Education's commitment, Department of Interior's commitment. We need that commitment, and it's not just money. It's also in-kind support and it's collaboration and it's communication, talking about the value of environmental ed. So I'll just end on one, uh, one more little quote. It's an Ethiopian proverb that I really love that says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. And I think that if we talk and work together and put our collective heads together and unite around the issue of we need environmental education for the future, we can do amazing things together. So thanks for allowing me to be a part of this amazing okay. panel. Uh, thanks, Judy. Is it? And Charlie, I think you had a yeah, comment. Yeah, I'd just like to add one thing. I, I think uh, when we talk about communication or uh, evaluation, um, one of the things that, that we rarely hear in this community is, uh, you know, the definition, I guess, is lacking. That's what, what is environmental education supposed to accomplish. You know, are we supposed to create awareness? Because I think that's what we think we're supposed to do, and we think that awareness is going to lead us somehow to action, but I don't know that we ever put together exactly how that awareness translates to action. Yeah. And I think if the environmental education community, or the education community in general, doesn't start to look at the hows and whys of how we actually get there, and we change the measurement bar maybe to look backwards from specific impacts on, say, global warming against the backdrop of what what science seems overwhelmingly to dictate is a ticking clock, then we, we do ourselves a tremendous disservice. And so I think how you measure, and I, I agree also that we need to be positive, but we also need to be realistic. Yeah. And we need to see that we, 
I mean, I'm scared. I'm, I'm worried about the future. And I think we all are. We wouldn't be here. And, and those, those are real worries. This is not hypothetical stuff. So we need to start backwards from the problem, maybe. Instead of evaluation that's based on programs and the effectiveness of individual programs, maybe we should start by saying, well, what are the problems that we need to address and what do we think those solutions are? And are we actually getting there with the efforts that we're doing? And, and I think I think that's and, something that's just critically and, important. And Charles, there's a huge movement going on that's looking, building on the open standards for the practice of conservation, that's looking at what are you trying to achieve, what conservation goals, environmental goals, and what's the role of environmental education in getting there, from citizen science to all the work that people are doing here. So there is a ton, that's, a ton of work going on in that area. And I would say most of the people in this audience are saying, Environmental education is not just awareness, it is action. And here is how we get to that action. And there is a huge body of research about what we know that, uh, that makes people take action. And turning that research into practice is one of the things that is actually happening, I mean, I, looking across the room, across the room. So I don't disagree with you, but it's actually happening in a big way, and we need to continue to do more. But, but I think that we can't ignore that the, that the commitment to the global commitment to legislation, uh, environmental protective legislation, is lacking. I think we can't ignore that. Uh, in a lot of cases, the polls indicate, in America anyway, that that public sentiment is going backwards, really contrary to what to what our uh, our efforts hope to achieve. And I, I think the public discourse is lacking. I think what you see on the news, what you hear in the street outside of this community is what we have to really ruthlessly focus on. We have to ruthlessly focus on, on people who don't think like we do and who don't believe that what we believe. And, and I agree. I, I know your, your new set of standards, which I just refreshed last night, your recommendations are excellent. I think that they take into consideration. But I think it, you know, it's civics, it's personal engagements, it's community engagement. Yeah. All of these things are critically important to be integrated somehow in an interdisciplinary way to the educational process. I think it's just we have to do that or, or we won't achieve changes fast enough to deal with the problems that are descending. So, so let, me, let me throw out one last question and see if anyone wants to take this on. Uh, when uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes uh, spoke, he talked about um, developing urban parks to try to bring the environment to uh, kids that are in the cities to youth that might not be able to get to Yosemite or to Yellowstone or to the Grand Canyon. Um, we know that a large number of, of children today spend an incredible amount of time online and playing video games. Um, can, can anyone on the panel talk about uh, ways that we might be able to make uh, the environment uh, relevant to uh, today's generation that is uh, spending their time plugged in and uh, spending a lot of time with their cell phones and their electronic devices. How can we make the environment um, exciting and engaging to that generation? Well, I guess, uh, look, I used to work with kids. I've never seen a kid who, I mean, I, I acknowledge it's an, it's an issue and my kids are fascinated with my iPad too, but I've never seen a kid who when you put them outside, particularly if you, if you start at a young age, is not very engaged. Some of this is, look, there's, there's technology is exciting. There's bad teaching that can make that deadening for kids too and turn them off on that stuff. So I actually, I come out of, I think, I like the urban parks. I'm actually, my sister-in-law is staying with us and she established an urban community garden in New York and they had an educational component. It's great. It's got to be educational though. I mean, again, if you go to urban school districts that are dealing with, and in, in a lot of places it's less than that 8%, and you tell them you just want to build a park, they're going to say, well, look, that's, that's terrific. But if you tell them you want to grow a garden, they're going to say, that's great. We actually have a lot of kids whose parents pick crops and we're not interested in doing that during the day too. We're trying to help these kids get to college. You've got to go and say, how is that urban park going to fit in with their overall goals? How is it going to fit in with science, with literature? A lot of the things Daniel was just talking about. It's so, it's so comprehensive. And the problem, the second piece I'll say, is, is you've got to fight for the resources to do this. Urban parks are great, but I think those kids should go to Yosemite. And field trips are not getting cut because of standardized testing. They're not getting cut because of all these things that you sort of hear about. They're getting, it's, it's budget cuts. 
gas is really expensive. It's been expensive for a while. School budgets. And, and so you got to say, if this is going to be important, it's going to be something that we do. And look, we do do it for affluent kids. They get these kinds of trips. Yeah, they and, go a, and another around thing here. is parents they, can't drive on field trips anymore. It's, it's, like yeah, it's, it, there's a complicated set of issues, but if you want to do this, I mean, we unfortunately in education, we frequently have a can't do sort of culture. People throw up, at, you know, lots of barriers. You can get kids out into, into these environments, and I would actually urge you all as a community, urban parks are great, urban gardens are great and so forth, but get kids out and engage in the natural world. I've never seen, and I've worked with some pretty hard cases, kids who have been involved with the system and so forth, who are not sort of moved and engaged when they actually get out into, into genuinely wild places. And so I think that's very important. I, I'd agree with Andrew, getting outside. And there's so many innovative things that are going on. Like in California, there are a group of funders that are providing the support for the buses to take kids outside. So getting over the barrier of the budget cuts. And when you think about Nature Bridge partnering with the National Park Service to get kids outside in residential areas, I think that's another way of getting people outside. But the technology itself can get people outside. And I'm looking at Danny Edelson from National Geographic. If you haven't looked at FieldScope and some of the work they're doing with technology to have an open app and platform for citizen science and getting kids outside, and it's cool. It's really neat. Or you look at what Disney's doing to make things kid friendly, but also connect people to nature. So I think there are a lot of ways to make it exciting. And it doesn't matter what kind of kid from what kind of background. I have seen all young people rally around curiosity, getting outside, being challenged, and I do think we have a huge task ahead of us, I, but I think... Well, one last okay, comment really. from Dan, and then we have to wrap up. And this up. is not a paid political announcement, but I think scouting is actually one of those ways <laughs> yeah. that takes it out of school, but is, is really building citizens. And it gets people outside, but it gets people doing projects for the community. It enables them and empowers them and rewards them for learning about a lot of different things that are what we're, we're talking about. And it can't just be in the schools. It has to be a more community-based thing. So things like scouting um, can play a very important role in this as well. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. And I think we can thank our panel for uh, a very lively discussion. Thank you.